Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Evolving Your Audit Analytics into Real-Time Risk Intelligence. My name is Rachel Lai, Demand Generation Manager at ACL, and will serve as your moderator for today. Before I introduce the speakers for today's webinar, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, our session will run for approximately 45 minutes with 15 minutes for Q&A at the very end. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A panel of your Zoom console. Our speakers will address them towards the end of the session. If we aren't able to get through all of your questions today, rest assured that we will follow up with you directly after the webinar. We are recording today's session and everyone who registered will receive an email with a link to the recording and a copy of today's presentation slides within the next few days. I'd now like to introduce our speakers for today's session. First up is Phil Shimura, Senior Product Manager at ACL. Phil is a, senior, is a seasoned product expert with a passion for bridging customers' needs with technology solutions. At ACL, Phil leads the execution of the go-to-market strategies for ACL's cloud-based, data-driven governance program. Some of his responsibilities include performing market analysis on how ACL addresses the evolving needs of governance, risk, and compliance professionals. Next, we have Victor Kuljak, Manager of GRC Adoption at ACL, who will be here to address your questions in the Q&A portion of the webinar. At ACL, Victor is primarily involved with the oversight of customer adoption and enablement of ACL GRC. Victor comes with over 10 years of Big Four public practice experience, which includes the performance of financial statement and co-sourced internal audits, general IT control reviews, risk and control reviews, and performing service organization control audits. He is a certified chartered accountant and holds a CRISC, CISA, and CGEIT certifications. Welcome to both of our speakers. I'll now pass the mic over to Phil to kick things off. Thanks, Rachel, and welcome, everyone. My name is Phil Shimura, Senior Product Manager here at ACO. Today, I'm excited to share about how automated control monitoring powered by audit analytics can intuitively inform your risk assessments in real time. I have with me my colleague, Victor, who, as Rachel said, has many years of experience in audit and is an expert in implementing our solution to help our customers achieve a more effective way to manage their audit and compliance programs. Perhaps say hello, Rick, Victor. Hello, everyone, and, th and thank you for the introduction, Phil. It's, uh, I'm really excited to be here today and to join you in this webinar. Right, so before we start, perhaps we'll run through uh, the agenda. So today, we're gonna start by talking about data analytics a little bit and introducing that. Then we'll talk about some of the disadvantages and pitfalls of uh, random sampling, uh, sample control testing. We'll introduce the concept of automated control monitoring. We'll present a use case, and finally, I'll attempt to bridge the gap between risk assessments and automated control monitoring and share how those really need to live together uh, in, this, in this world of um, dynamic data that we live in. And then we'll close with some Q&A. So don't forget to submit those questions uh, into um, that window and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we uh, tackle as many as, as we can given the time we have. Okay, let's begin. So data analytics is by no means a new concept. Its application is widespread across various fields with results that continue to prove its value. For anybody new to data analytics, I'll try to define it in this way. It refers to qualitative and quantitative techniques and processes used to enhance productivity and business gain. Data is extracted, aggregated, harmonized, and categorized to identify and analyze trends, patterns, and anomalies. Ultimately, it streamlines otherwise manual and laborious techniques in order to aid organizations and individuals to more efficiently reach a quantifiable conclusion and make calculated decisions based on real-time data. That's a mouthful. But like anything new, depending on the industry or field of application, data analytics has had its detractors. Some of the questions people may ask are, how much effort is required to ensure clean data is used for analysis? How accurate is the analysis? And can I actually rely on the data analysis algorithms 
to guide decisions I've been making with my head for years, given my insight, experience, and context. All valid questions. So I realize that we're here today to talk about audit analytics, but let me step back and draw a parallel to a famous sports movie, one of my favorites. You, you may recognize this image. It's a still uh, from the movie Moneyball. Uh, Moneyball, for those who are not familiar with the movie, told the account of the Oakland Athletics baseball team's 2002 season and their general manager, Billy Bean's attempts to assemble a competitive team. In the film, Bean, faced with the departure of three star players and the franchise's limited budget for acquiring replacement players, built a team of undervalued talent by taking a sophisticated sabermetric approach towards scouting and analyzing players. Sabermetrics is just a fancy term for analytics, but it's a methodology to help baseball fans learn about the sport through objective evidence. This is performed by evaluating players in every aspect of the game, but specifically batting, pitching, and fielding. So Billy, being a major advocate of sabermetrics, took an analytical approach to evaluating players based on purely an objective uh, point of view, so objective data, not the eyeball test. In doing so, the A's architected and fielded a team in a way that was highly unfamiliar and, and suspect to pretty much every other team in the league. Despite a comparative lack of star power, the A's surprised the baseball world by finishing first in the American League West, which included a win streak of 20 consecutive teams. Obviously, I'm a big baseball fan, so quite passionate about this story. But the reason I bring up this reference is to highlight the skepticism and uncertainty with which the idea of data analytics was greeted when Billy completely reinvented the sports club's entire strategy for making decisions and analyzing the risks versus benefits of acquiring certain players. And the same might be said about audit analytics, where the idea of automating controls testing is a more efficient and productive means of evaluating their effectiveness. Additionally, testing accuracy and thoroughness increases because the speed and efficiency of robotics process automation allows you to review your entire data population, including hundreds, if not thousands of transactions in a fraction of the time it would require to do so manually, which is why it's, it's not surprising that sample testing is so prevalent in today's more manual processes. And we'll visit the idea of sample testing in a little bit. So we have guests in the audience from many different verticals, industries, geographies, and positions of risk and governance, including audit and compliance today. It's very possible that any number of you may feel under-resourced, over-regulated, drowning in pages of regulatory requirements, and ultimately pulled in countless directions to maintain oversight of your compliance programs. How do you manage this? At the end of the day, all your compliance efforts aim to provide you intelligence and context on your most important layer of visibility, risk. But what is the best method to achieve this? The key is to identify your risks and contextualize them by aligning relevant controls and procedures to them so that testing and evaluation of each control or procedure directly informs your risk assessments. Likewise, measures you take to improve the effectiveness of those controls or procedures should result in a direct improvement of your risk score. I hope that makes sense. So is the answer just to thoroughly test your controls? Well, to many, that's easier said than done. A cost drain on most audit departments is control testing, which takes many forms, but is generally a manual sample testing, 30 units or so, of whether certain control attributes are working. Many audit and finance teams have asked how to automate their Sarbanes-Oxley and control testing in order to release themselves from the chains of these manual testing requirements, sometimes sapping as much as 70% of their time budgets for the year. And study, any study will show that automation can reduce testing times and costs by at least 20 times while improving quality but yet a majority of organizations still spend a majority of their resource time budgets on manual management controls testing for external audit purposes. I mentioned earlier that sample testing 
is often conducted because it is almost inconceivable to test an organization's entire data population. From controls to individual transactions, the data is simply too voluminous with too few resources in an already resource-strapped audit and compliance team to carry out such work. Although the arguments in favor of sample, sample testing are quite obvious, there are just as many, if not more, reasons to be cautious of this approach. Now, before I, I talk a little bit more about audit, audit analytics and specifically uh, automated control monitoring, I'd like to show this model. Perhaps some of you have seen this before. It's ACL's audit analytics capability model. If you're interested in audit analytics, this is a great visual model to help you understand where you currently fall along the spectrum. I'll go through each one of these levels and, and describe them a little bit. So level one, basic. As indicated by the name of this first stage, it involves very basic analytical abilities. Purely ad hoc audit work requiring an analytic expert to suggest application of analytics in particular areas. It is, however, backwards looking and reactive in nature. Level two, applied. This is a little bit more graduated in that as your organization evolves with data as an audit function, you begin asking yourself, how do we put analytic enabled steps inside every audit plan? Again, a step up, but still often looking backwards. Level three, managed. This focuses on building a more sustainable program by centralizing your analytic capability. Perhaps putting together a central team and centralized library of pre-built data analysis that all different auditors on the team can make use of. Uh, level four, automated. This comes after you build up this library of analytics. You can then proceed to automate it and run it on a schedule to get into this notion of continuous auditing. Level five, and the last stage, monitoring. This is where you begin pushing some of the audit functions to the business by advocating that some of the more critical areas can be monitored in real time for a more proactive approach so that issues are identified even before they have a chance to become problems. So this is a model that if you're interested in. Um, like Rich said, we will um, share these slides later and you can take a look at this and, and study this a little bit more. So how does automated control testing and monitoring apply in the context of audit analytics? Uh, this next diagram showcases the automated control monitoring process uh, in, in detail. So we'll go through step by step as this animation builds. So step one, the first step is to collect, compile, standardize or harmonize and compare data from disparate systems and separate instances. This may involve multiple databases and numerous fields within different tables, but suffice to say it's something far beyond what can be reasonably accomplished using manual processes. By identifying specific fields within each system, you want to query, uh, sorry, by identifying specific fields within each system you want to query and aggregating this data, you can contextually analyze entire data populations to identify anomalies and exceptions. Data access and blending is 80% of the job, but it becomes incredibly challenging and expensive when many tools are involved. And knowing what questions to ask your data in context of your risk and control domain is critical. ACL's technology has been solving these challenges for more than 30 years and is built to provide assurance and performance insight over process, risk, control, and compliance areas. Step two, with the data sources identified, data can be extracted for analysis across the entire population, not just a sample. Recurring analysis can be easily automated to free up time and ensure analysis is consistently performed every time. The analysis can be configured to suit the periodic periodicity or cadence, uh, be it hourly, daily, weekly, quarterly of your organization. This removes the burden of needing to remember to execute this on an ad hoc manual basis, which can result in a backwards looking point of view on your exceptions. Step three. As a result of the analysis, exceptions are identified. ACL's technology allows inspection of data flows and the ability to distribute that intelligently to individuals for further investigation using tools like surveys and questionnaires.
For example, you can reduce false positives by automatically combining human insight with raw data. For example, automatically triggering a questionnaire when a certain criteria is met. And the final step, once exceptions are identified and verified, um, alert stakeholders like control owners and compliance uh, for the purpose of investigation, incident management, and remediation. With a system able to automatically alert pre-designated persons about issues or exceptions, send reminders if not looked at within a specific amount of time, or escalate for urgent remediation, there's really no need to manually assign exceptions to stakeholders within an organization, which is a big time saver, and it also reduces email traffic. And there's no need to physically chase down individuals to ensure that the exception was taken care of. Where material exceptions are uncovered, ACL's automated technology can trigger remediation workflows to ensure that the right people are notified all within the context of preset priority statuses and escalation paths. So now that I've presented on the process uh, model, what, what are the real benefits of automated control monitoring? First, it gets you in front of your exceptions for a proactive approach. It helps you more easily meet audit and compliance requirements. It analyzes the entire data population, not just a sample. It creates a repeatable and documented process. It supports transparency, improves efficiency, and leads to data-driven decisions. And finally, it informs and identifies organizational risk, both the known and the emerging ones. So, what do we recommend as, as a getting started um, uh, model? Well, there's four steps. First is to identify and verify risks. The second, document key processes and controls. Number three, assess internal controls. And number four, document report results. Document and report results. I'll go through each one of these steps in a little bit more detail. So the first one, Identify and verify risks. So the first thing you want to do is to determine high risk processes and areas by performing a data driven entity wide assessment and then develop an implementation plan. Second step is to evaluate the process and control documentation. Perhaps you need to update or create new processes uh, by performing a walkthrough um, and uh, drafting up some flowcharts. Uh, then identify key controls and match any of these to identified risks in the high process areas. In the third step, you'll want to assess the design of internal controls to determine if they're actually in place. Controls may be in place, but uh, if they're not designed correctly, they may need to be re uh, rethought. And then once they're, they are in place, you want to assess, constantly assess the effectiveness of those internal controls and um, make continuous improvements uh, as you go along. And number four, document and report results. You wanna document the results, report findings to stakeholders and remediate any exceptions. Despite the fact that I've presented this as four independent steps, the reality is that they operate in a closed loop fashion in support of a true continuous improvement model. So try to think of it as a cyclical process. So to summarize that, that middle section that we just went through, here's another diagram to help you visualize just how automated control monitoring powered by data analytics drives the audit management process. ACL's technology platform connects you to any data source and lets you run sophisticated risk analytics and detect anomalies or patterns that you simply can't eliminate with any amount of random sampling, spreadsheet wizardry, or generic BI or business intelligence. ACL gives you a centralized platform for collaborative team-based work, automated data extraction, and blending with IT trusted connections, continuous monitoring, and remediation workflow. Find hidden anomalies and uncover strategic risk and opportunity for improvement with big data crunching power and the sustainability of a platform like ACL's. So with that said, Let's take a look at um, a brief and simple um, use case. Perhaps most helpful would be um, a use case example of how audit, audit analytics can really help expose a problem 
and take the data to form corrective measures to remediate future risk. So let's take a look at a simple example like accounts payable. So the problem here, I won't read the entire slide, you will see these slides afterwards. So the problem here uh, was around the propriety or perhaps the impropriety nature of some vendor payments. So despite attempts at corrective action, multiple attempts, additional oversight was requested to validate these measures. However, the data was fragmented across different disparate systems, making it very hard to assess and access. So the approach to this challenge involved using process modeling and analytics. Automation and analytics were applied to consolidate the data into a meaningful format, uh, meaningful format for analysis. And finally, a continuous monitoring process was implemented. As a result, some material findings and exceptions were discovered, including improper payments, duplicate payments, and potential fraud. In the end, the customer was able to identify the root causes and leverage the power of quanti quantifiable data to formulate corrective recommendations to mitigate a repeat of this in the future. As I mentioned, simple example, but it's just an idea of how, um, how the data and uh, analytics can be used to uncover, um, make recommendations, and remediate. So how does this look within the product itself, you might be asking? And how, again, does this relate back to risk? So um, I want to dive a little bit into the product um, and just show um, some, um, some images of, of what this looks like uh, from, um, from our product standpoint. Uh, so customers we work with uh, have typically identified their top risks and attributed three to four um, key risk uh, indicators or, or KRIs. These KRIs help them score each of their top risks in a dynamic uh, real-time model. And how is that possible? Well, as real-time indicators, KRIs help inform that high, medium, low rating for a particular risk. When KRIs cross thresholds instantly, you're notified and can decide what corrective action to take. You may want to reevaluate that risk, or you can take immediate action to drive that KRI back down below that threshold um, to a safe, uh, safe, safe place. Additionally, you can automate this risk assessment. Uh, you can define risk thresholds as low, medium, or high, and link each risk to an automated and continuous analytic. Based on the analytics, which mines through relevant data from disparate systems and sources, or tests identified controls that impact your risks, when the linked KRI crosses the threshold, it changes the scoring factor, in this case, the risk likelihood, from low to medium and creates and escalate, uh, creates an escalation workflow. And escalation workflows can take many forms, but one of the uh, most simple explain is uh, that of, of triggers. So escalation workflows can be driven by defining triggers. Uh, made up of three defining attributes, you can easily determine what metrics kick off what action, like notifying someone, emailing someone, um, and uh, so whom to notify and when, um, uh, complete with reminders. So uh, the system will continue setting, uh, sending reminders out on your behalf so you're not chasing after them and it will escalate um, to a higher level if, if that person is not responding or taking action. So super simple, but incredibly powerful in automating what would traditionally be a game of cat and mouse. Uh, in a, a risk heat map view, the resulting data uh, as you see here, changes in real time since each one of the risk areas are driven by a different key risk indicator as they're informed by data analytics that underlie them, right? So as the key risk indicators change, the positions of these, uh, these bubbles, these, um, these bubbles in this heat map will change in terms of color and position. Finally, ACL's data-driven approach feeds our vis visualizations in real time. So visualizations are, are interpretations like graphs, charts, pie charts, um, and, and what have you. But more importantly, these interpretations or visualizations tell a rich story about your risk and compliance projects. 
But what's more, you can take these individualized visualizations and create a collage, which we call storyboards at ACL, to reveal a holistic picture where the sum of all the visualizations tell a greater story. So with story, you're more able to effectively communicate your findings to the board, executives, and other stakeholders who consume the final data in a much more distilled format than what you may be accustomed to. Storyboards can be easily customized to include or omit information as required to suit unique audience groups. Even we at ACL leverage storyboards to communicate with our board, be it NPS scores, financial results, HR data, what have you. It's incredibly uh, powerful information and the beauty of it is that it's in real time and what you see at any one point is the most up-to-date information so long as uh, your, your um, controls and your um, KRIs are set up um, to, to feed uh, these, these visualiz visualizations. You basically build them once and um, they're, they're there for you and update uh, for you on a regular basis. So we have so many customers across our 30 years uh, of existence, more than I can list on this slide, who have come to trust and rely on our technology to inform them in their pursuit to enhance productivity and business gain. They believe in the power of audit analytics and automated control monitoring to inform the risk assessments. So in closing today, my hope is that you do too. Now, um, I would like to mention that if um, any part of those, uh, those screenshots uh, really piqued your interest, um, that uh, you do sign up for a, a follow-up webinar on April 26. Um, and uh, the time will be 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And uh, my colleague who's uh, on this webinar with me, Victor, um, will be um, providing a brief uh, demo, a, a live in-product demo uh, of, um, uh, of the different uh, modules and different components of our solution that, uh, that relate to um, analytics and, and risk, uh, risk assessments. Okay, so with that, um, I spoke a little bit fast, so I think I ended a little bit early, uh, but uh, that just means more time for questions. Um, and so Victor, uh, would you mind um, uh, leading us through the question period? Sure, will do, Phil. Uh, thank you very much for that. And thank you for promoting that webinar that will be happening next week. So as Phil mentioned, if you would like to get a sense of how this may look or how it would operate, I would strongly encourage you to join me next week where I'll be giving a, a sort of a guided demo just to highlight and uh, put a bit of focus on some of the, the finer points Phil mentioned today. Um, with that, uh, it is the question and answer time, and we do have a number of questions that have come in. Um, and one of them is actually quite a, quite a basic uh, question, but quite a great one. It's simply, how do you get started? And the answer to that is, if you look at uh, the whole and try to do everything at once, you are going to be overwhelmed and probably not get very far. So our experience has been that this is something that is a journey. So it's best to take a phased approach and start with the low hanging fruit. So for example, if you wanted to get some of the basics out of the way, but also build in a bit of buy-in uh, to expand your continuous monitoring program, we've seen the largest successes in very simple things such as uh, travel and entertainment expenditure, monitoring and follow-up, of any sort of uh, exceptions or any outliers. We've also seen that uh, focusing on procurement or accounts payable. So for example, you know, checking up uh, changes to what's happening around your vendor profiles or whether your three-way matching is operating effectively. Those would be ways to, to kick off and begin your journey and get started and that would give you sort of that, that catalyst to, to move on. So some of our customers, this has been a three year journey, whereas other ones have gotten away with it in about a year and a half. So it kind of depends on your, your appetite and your culture to get it done. But uh, fundamentally, you do want to have a phased approach and take it easy in that sense. Uh, the other question we have here is, um, how do you get buy-in from executive management? 
And that's always a challenge anytime you want to acquire any type of solution or product um, that you're considering to help you. And, you know, that one, I'd always say that your best bet is to start with the end in mind. So what we mean with that is figure out what it is that you want to solve for. And uh, usually it's alleviating a pain or a burden management has to deal with. So if it means getting a pulse on what's going on sort of transactionally, uh, Phil had a great example uh, early on in the slides where we had a um, storyboard. Uh, all right, I'm gonna try to keep going. It appears that the uh, fire alarm has, uh, has, or a fire drill has been uh, initiated in the building. So I'm gonna see <laughs> how far I get. I apologize with any background noise, but uh, let's push on. So uh, Phil gave a really good example with a state of cybersecurity storyboard. If you'd like to go back and take a look and see through the slides, I'd recommend that. And that's usually what management is looking for. Um, they're looking for something easy, something that makes sense and something that is digestible. So if you go and start throwing a whole complicated set of analytics or start getting really technical, um, throwing rules and uh, alerts and exceptions that are gonna start cluttering their mailbox and create a lot of noise, but not really tell them what they need to know, it's gonna be a much tougher sell. So fundamentally on that one, start with the end in mind and uh, move on with that. All right, um, I'm just looking at some of the other questions here. Uh, one of them is, in your experience, what have you found uh, to be the best strategy to deal with high volumes? And uh, this is something that many audit departments and even you know, the first, second, and third line of defense tend to have to deal with is the noise factor and dealing with false positives. And there's a number of strategies um, that you can employ to deal with, the, with this. Um, so I can think of three um, right off the bat. Uh, the first one being it comes to the level of precision when you're defining, for example, your rule set or your script. In other words, the code or the rules that you apply, as well as sort of profiling your data to understand what it is that you need to exclude as a false positive. The other way to do it is actually on the triggering of the alerts. So again, it comes down to identifying a baseline that you want to work with and um, looking at what is considered normal and what is considered the, the sort of the, the normal spread in your population that you're actually monitoring. And once you have that baseline, um, it's fine tuning the triggering of alerts and exceptions and messages that go out so uh, whereas the first approach was kind of looking at it at the front end in generating sort of your rule sets, the second uh, approach is uh, looking more at um, alerting. So you're still generating the, the data, so to speak, but you're not necessarily reacting or responding to everything that you're getting. You're being a little bit more selective when you set um, your trigger or your alerts up. Uh, and then the last approach on that one is um, to do with, again, uh, taking your profile of your data and looking at what's normal and kind of um, skipping that part and focusing more on outliers. So I mentioned earlier, if you're looking at something like travel and entertainment expenditure, if you are profiling your, your data and you can see that your average monthly or quarterly spend by employees tends to be um, less than $5,000. Uh, and you notice that there's a couple of exceptions greater than $10,000 or $15,000. That would be a good indication that you want to focus on your outliers and kind of not worry so much, at least initially, on the ones that are uh, below $5,000. So again, it's almost stratifying your population and focusing your efforts and your alerts on the outliers rather than on everything that is potentially going on. All right. Um, one of the 
Simpler questions, will ACL send an alert message when found? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, that's sort of one of the fundamentals. Uh, Phil did allude to that earlier on in a couple of his slides. So that is also something that's sort of part and parcel of the ACL solution. So you kind of get that with, with uh, uh, straight out of the box. So. All right, uh, let me just see if we've had any, any other ones. I do see a good one. Um, around what is your experience uh, around uh, external auditors feedback on on this approach um, it does vary so um, you know there's no sort of set um, response that auditors give you uh, it's all the way from they love it and they understand it to they uh, they almost you know sort of poke holes at it and want to want to make sure that all your alerting is complete, uh, it's accurate, it's not, uh, it's not generating a, a false negative. So um, sometimes depending on their approach and the level of assurance they're looking to gain um, from your work, let's say your, your internal audit and as external auditors, they're looking to place reliance on your work. Uh, that approach would largely dictate to what extent they believe they can, uh, you know, A, rely on your work and B, trusted. So it does go through various levels of stress testing. Um, the more challenging external auditors that uh, uh, struggle a little bit with the concept, um, our experience has been that if you are uh, able to take the time to outline your sort of methodology, um, outline sort of the quality control that you've built in um, and you know kind of you know the, the regular way you'd assure an auditor um, when they're looking at an account balance or a series of transactions the rules don't really change with our solution it's probably just the way that you would have to approach it to um, uh, get them satisfied that what you have is actually decent uh, we have another question here saying that most of our data is in SAP. Um, are you saying that you can directly pull information from SAP into ACL? Uh, absolutely, yes, is the answer. So we actually have something called Direct Link, which is a certified um, SAP connector. So SAP themselves have gone through and vetted it and approved it for uh, connection and use to an SAP ERP system meaning that the connector or direct link is not going to do anything untoward. It's not suddenly going to change your, your data, alter your, your data, or, or even worse, fundamentally bring down your SAP system because you're trying to run a, a data analytic. Um, also, I would like to add that this is not just limited to SAP. Um, we also have a regular ODBC connector. Uh, meaning that we can actually connect to a plethora of, of data systems. Um, so, you know, the, the sort of one of the fundamental principles of, of ACL right from the beginning has been that if, if there's data, there is a way to connect to it. So um, usually this is not something that is uh, really considered a huge hurdle or uh, a, a challenge. So. Um, related to that, we have another question that says, um, analyzing data requires taking data out of the system and in ACL. How do you lower the fear from uh, the security group from the risk stemming from data exposition? So um, that is also a great question. And, you know, again, the fundamentals sort of principle with, with ACL is that it's a tool for auditors so, um, or originally it was a tool for auditors, it's expanded to that now, meaning that you need to be able to give an auditor that warm, fuzzy feeling that, you know, that, you know, risks and controls are covered. So again, there's various ways and means of, of handling this. So when you're actually um, extracting information, if you have a strong security concern, you could actually set up an on-premise, um, we call it an analytics exchange server that you can configure you know in such a way that if you need to have encryption or hashing of information let's say you don't want to expose social security numbers credit card numbers um, sensitive you know employee or customer information within a data set you can still apply ways and means to 
protect that data and and ensure that you know you're not going to have a data leak or expose that data to an unacceptable level of security risk okay. um, we have another question uh, that says we have ac analytics can we use charting with that absolutely so um, part of the focus in in recent times at acl has been on visualizing your data and kind of moving away from having you know the results of your analytics or the results of any sort of continuous auditing um, or co controls monitoring um, where you have something you know spat out as a as a flat table or a list um, you can certainly create beautiful visualizations and again the uh, I, I would point you if you're still with us to look at the um, earlier slides in Phil's presentation around some of the storyboards. Any sort of graph or visualization that you're seeing that is produced um, within ACL, either on the analytics side, on the desktop application, or even within the cloud product. And that allows you to share your results in a, in a visual way rather than having sort of hard data, hard lists of of exceptions or outputs from any sort of analytics or continuous monitoring that you have. Um, does the solution work for SOX testing? Absolutely, again, yes. Um, we have a number of clients that use this for um, more sort of continuous and proactive controls monitoring. So instead of going through and looking back in time and seeing whether a control was performed, you can actually go and take a forward looking approach and um, use that to, to kind of get ahead of the curve rather than sort of, you know, go test, uh, you know, looking backwards and then that automatically puts you at a disadvantage because you're, you're behind the ball already. Thing, things have happened in the past and you're only discovering them as you're, you're conducting your, your testing or your analysis now. Um, so, yes. Um, the other question we have here is to um, to fully implement, do you need ACL GRC? Um, is there a way to do something similar with only analytics? Um, so uh, ACL analytics and ACL GRC are very complementary. So while you can kind of do that first sort of baseline of continuous monitoring, in other words, um, you know, extracting data, defining sort of rule sets um, and defining you know, um, criteria for, for um, identifying exceptional items or outliers. Um, sort of the other piece to that is ACL GRC. So that, that piece allows you then to leverage that and um, kind of uh, the way I describe it is you, you do a bit of load shedding in that. Um, usually if you're sitting with analytics and you're running them, um, you will struggle to share the results of what you're doing and ultimately it'll probably be you know, on your shoulders to do all the follow-up, the investigation, the analysis, and um, you know, there the won't be a systematic way and a, and a neat sort of transparent and uh, uh, process that is well-governed that will allow you to you know, have an audit trail of your follow-up and your analysis and categorization. That's where the power of GRC comes in with triggers and workflows that will enable you to kind of, you know, push the follow-up and investigation outside of your arena and, for example, put it straight back to the first line to, to sort of the business, um, you know, the actual control owners or even the control operators, for example, could become part of your follow-up, your investigation and your analysis and kind of you're just the, the facilitator or the custodian of the results of that process and you, you kind of help report on and give some visibility into what what is going on. Um, Victor, I think um, I think in in the interest of uh, of the file arm drill, uh, we may need to end this a little bit early just uh, sure. just to make sure that uh, uh, you're in compliance. Uh, pardon the pardon the pun um, yeah. with the with the program, but uh, and I appreciate. Um, the guests on uh, on the chat uh, uh, imploring us to do so as well. So, but um, we we have all the questions and uh, we will follow up. We do have uh, your information. Uh, but if you're really interested in, in um, 
uh, ask more questions, Victor will be available in the follow-up webinar. So I, I really encourage you to, um, to register for that. Uh, it, Victor will be available to, um, to demonstrate. Maybe that'll answer some of your questions already, uh, or you can uh, just hold your questions and, and ask him. Um, it's not very far away, April 26th. Uh, but I think we'll end it here. And I really appreciate, we, Victor and I really appreciate your time uh, and for attending. And um, as Rachel said, we will send out the link uh, to the recording uh, as well as the slides um, in, in short order after this. So thank you everybody very much for your time. Thank you everyone.